Hey, welcome into a bonus episode of Texans on Tap. I'm Brandon Strange with Josh Jordan. You can follow him on X at Josh Jordan 975 and read him daily on sportsmap.com. Make sure you're following the channel so you're uh, following along with us all season long as we ramp up to the 24, 2024 Texan season and beyond. We want you on the ride with us. We do appreciate the support and hit like on the video if you haven't already. Uh, Josh, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation today, as you know, is there's a narrative that's kind of popped up in the media over the last few days, which is about the Texans playing with expectations this season. Are they unrealistic? Is it something that, uh, you know, is going to put pressure on the team or the players or coaches? Uh, will teams see the Texans coming now because they're on their radar? And one of the genesis of these media conversations was the Pat McAfee show. Let me get Pat up on the screen here. Boom, boom. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, share these uh, this little clips here, and then we can react to this afterwards. But here's, here's J.J. Watt on the Pat McAfee show talking about the Texans this season. Where this fran Think about where this franchise was two years ago. Um, and then you think about where they are today and some of the conversations that are happening and some of the expectations that are being put upon this team. Um, I do think that you could say it's a situation where the excitement level and the expectation level has built so high so fast that that it almost is starting to become unrealistic. But when you like have that. a coach like D'Amico Ryans, when you have a quarterback like C.J. Stroud and the mentality that those two have and the way that they handle themselves and the way they conduct their business, I think that they are uniquely positioned to handle this situation and, and continue to excel. Okay, and so let's jump ahead to they pick up this conversation around here. Let's pick that up. To watch this whole year. I liked what you said there about the Texans. Like the expectations are just getting to a point where is this even realistic in a guy's second year? You know, mm -hmm. this is CJ Stratt, but he's putting it on himself. You know, you add Stephon Diggs there. Everybody's expecting Stephon Diggs to have like MVP year next year. And we, hey, we're pulling for you. CJ, don't put that pressure on yourself. But you also nope. have to think like crazy. Like Stephon Diggs, unbelievable player. But Nico Collins is also still there. Tank Dell, like they have Fernand Dalton Schultz. Like it is. I mean, if you truly look at that squad and then yeah. you also, okay, so then you say, okay, if they have all those skill players, then they must not have that great of an offensive line because of the money issues. Well, yeah, well, they have Laramie Tunsil. They have Titus Howard. Like, they are they are built well. And I think you do have to give credit to Nick Casario. I think you have to give credit to D'Amico and the vision he's building. But, I mean, really, I'm trying to temper it myself because of how excited I am. But I, it's really hard to look at that team and not be super excited. Okay, so JJ's hyped, but he's trying to temper his expectations for the team. Um, what, what's your response to that, Josh? Yeah, I get it. it. You know, some of the takeaways from his quotes, ex expectations built so high so fast, uh, almost starting to become unrealistic. And, and I get it. I, I think part of that's because look where they came from. I mean, it was so bad. They were the laughing stock of the league for, for a couple of years. It, it didn't feel like as a Texans fan there, there was going to be any, any way out of this. And that's why McAfee's kind of upset is how quickly the Texans have turned around. But I think it just feels so fast because of, of where they've come from. And I think the other part, it's not as fast because if you look at the rosters, they were more talented when we than we really thought they were. They just didn't have any quarterback play and they didn't have a coach that, that knew what they were doing. I mean, if you look at the roster, Nico Collins, Derek Stingley, Steven Nelson, Christian Harris, Jonathan Grenard, Cashman, Tank Dell. There was a lot of talent on this roster. It's just that they weren't being used the right way. There wasn't a great quarterback to, to to elevate them and make them play competent football. And then the other thing you take away from that list of names I just gave right there, a lot of those guys aren't going to be on the roster here in 2024. But I feel like for the most part, outside of Steven Nelson, I think they've replaced all those guys and in many cases upgraded. And and I love McAfee playing the heel here. That's why I think he fits into pro wrestling uh, so well. Uh, but as far as expectations go, you know, and and maybe teams seeing the Texans coming now, now they know what to expect. I think you know at at the end of the day, they were after game seven, eight last season. I think teams took uh, the Texans seriously, and and teams like the Titans who had seen them before and had time to prepare. Uh, and I just think that you, uh, you know, this, this league has plenty of time to catch up. And, and I think the most important part now is this team's better. 
than it was last year. So it has improved. Now, does that necessarily equate to on-field results? We don't know. Uh, we don't you know, know how they're going to respond to the increased difficulty of their schedule, but we're not talking about the schedule. What we're talking about is expectations and this team playing with expectations. And I don't, I don't really see that being an issue for the team as it's currently constructed right now. I certainly don't see it uh, being a problem for C.J. Stroud. No, it, that was Shannon Sharp's big beef with, with Stephen A, because Stephen A had a problem with Shannon putting the Bills and the Dolphins above the Texans in his power rankings. And I get it. Shannon's like, they, they've never had expectations. That's what's different. But I'm with you, Brandon. I mean, what was it, week three when they beat the Steelers and CJ kind of threw a party on them? And I mean... After that, everybody was kind of watching CJ. He was actually kind of a front runner for MVP, not even just rookie of the year for a good right. portion of the season. So it's not like the NFL was sleeping on them last year. So I don't really think it's that. And I think I think CJ kind of felt what it can be like, all the challenges that you have to face in the NFL as a rookie. With He had almost no running game. He had a makeshift offensive line for the early part of the year. Eventually, he uses, loses Tank Dell, his best weapon, has to get over that. How many centers did he play with last year? I mean, there was just so much adversity that he already dealt with in his rookie year where I'm just like, I don't think this is going to bother him. So... I just I think he's going to be okay, especially not having a running game. And that's something as a rookie quarterback, you want to play good defense. You want to be able to run the ball. You don't want to put too much on your quarterback. Texans couldn't do that. They had to just say, here are the keys, CJ. We, we can't win unless you lead us to victory. And I thought it was interesting that the Texans kind of improved their running game by adding Stefan Diggs right. and, and Joe Mixon. So it wasn't adding a, and who knows what they do in the draft, but it wasn't by, hey, let's upgrade the offensive line or let's get some better blocking tight ends. What's interesting is they faced the sixth highest rate of stacked boxes last year. So it's not a surprise that they struggled to run the football, but how do you how do you get people to not stack the box as much this year? Well, you go get Stefan Diggs to put with Nico and to put with Tank Dell, and you go get Joe Mixon who can catch the ball out of the backfield. And Mixon's also he's a great a great runner when you're under center, something they didn't do a whole lot of with the Bengals. Joe Burrow doesn't really like being under center and doing play action, turning his back to the field. So they were doing a lot of stuff out of shotgun with Mixon. I think this offense fits him a lot better. And I say all this to say, I think the pieces around CJ are going to be better. The running game is going to be better, better targets to throw to better offensive line play. So I think there's only one way for CJ to go. He's going to go straight up. Well, and it, I love that statistic because it makes sense when you think about it because of the available weapons that were on the field by the end of the season. They really yeah. only had, opposing teams only had to really honor Nico Collins in the in the uh, passing game as a, as a target. And so you really could load up the box on and, and kind of, you know, stop um, motor from, from, you know, really get being able to plant his feet and go. Um, you know, and you talk about digs and obviously that's, you know, one of the big, uh, you know, ads that you know, where you're you know, looking to improve. And again, this kind of goes back before I get into digs necessarily, it just kind of goes back to the bigger point about expectations is it's one thing. I think if you're comparing the same team year over year and you go like, Oh, this, this team has to meet these expectations. They're playing with these expectations. This really isn't the same team either. Like you've upgraded at so many different places. Now this isn't the same team having to live up to expectations. This is a new team having to play within its ability. So I don't even know if expectations, I think really, uh, you know, I guess what, what JJ is talking about is maybe uh, fan expectations and kind of media expectations and maybe tempering it from a performance standpoint. But um, I, I think, you know, and, and sure, I think that's fair. I, I think it's fair to say like, okay, you know, are they, are they going to, you know, go out there and, and win 16 games? Uh, you know, if they can't win every week, can't win every week. But I do think that, uh, you know, some perspective as to who this team was to who they are is really important to look at. But let's look at, let's look at Diggs because one of the things that has been uh, one of the narratives that has kind of hovered around this trade has been the as Diggs uh, 2023 statistical regression. And uh, a lot of the naysayers of the trade point to how his season ended and they say, hey, Texans are getting a guy that's washed. What's your concern level with Diggs and kind of what have you seen that maybe gives you a little bit more confidence and what you expect to see from him in 2024? 
I, I just I think it's going to be what happened at the week 10, week 11 point in the season for the Bills last year. And what happened is they changed offensive coordinators. Josh Allen was turning the ball over a ton. When they they switched over after week 10 to week 11, they, they went to a new OC. And it makes sense because in week 10, Josh Allen turned the ball over three times. They lost to the Broncos, a, a team they should have beaten. They only threw for 177 yards. So they were just kind of like, enough is enough. This Bills team is good if we just stop shooting ourselves in the foot, stop turning the ball over. So well, how do you not turn the ball over as much? Well, you start running the ball more. You, st- you start taking less chances down the field when they're not necessary. So that's what kind of happened with Diggs. They stopped using them down the field as much. And really through play action is what shocked me. It, there's an article we'll pull up in a second on CBS Sports, but this is one of the stats. Diggs had 23 receiving yards on play action in the nine games games with Brady as the OC compared to 346 yards off of play action earlier in the season before they made the OC change. Yeah, so, so let's let's, let's yeah. bring this up. So this you you mentioned this CBS Sports Doug Clawson has this uh why Stefan Diggs should return to superstar form with Texans after discouraging final stretch with Bills. This is exactly what we're talking about. And yep. when we talk about that statistical regression that happened at the end of the year, let's just take a real quick look at this this first table that he has here is Stefan Diggs last season including playoffs. And you can see uh receiving yards per game um, you know half, you know, basically less than half. Uh, the touchdowns in the first six games were five to last 13 were three hundred yard games went from five to zero in the last 13 games. But to your point, let's look at what happened before and after Brady walk us through some of this here. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look at this right here. It's there's a huge discrepancy in the change and it's, it's actually all good news for Texans fans here. So let me pull this uh, ad up. Okay, so yards per reception. Look at that jumping down from almost 12 to about nine. Receiving yards per game going from 87 to like 43. The receptions per game going way down. Uh, You move down target share is a different story. I'm going to cherry pick a a few of these stats here. It, It appeared to me that he averaged so many fewer yards because they weren't using him that much. They weren't asking Diggs to do a lot of these things. They weren't targeting him out of the slot that much. There was just so many opportunities that they just weren't taking advantage of. Half of Diggs' targets with Brady were either screens or quick hitches. That's stuff where the Texans are going to get the ball to him down the field. And that's the other thing, the, the not using him on play action. That's not going to be a thing with the Texans. That That's what they are fantastic at. So I feel like so many of the issues that he had, he's not going to have to deal with in Houston. So I, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. These, you know, the numbers really uh, jump out at you. The, I mean, the targets, he just like, like the author says here, it just, he wasn't really a focal point of the offense. Um, and not to say that he will necessarily, necessarily be, I think we've, we've covered it on this, this channel. We've had it in this, com- this podcast. We've talked about like, you're not going to require him to be a number one necessarily because of you do still have Nico Collins, but he's going to get, I think a lot more availability because the defense is going to have to honor in the same way. We talked about the stacked boxes and them having to honor, uh, the passing game, you're, you're also going to have to honor, uh, you have to be honest against guys like Tank Dell, who are burners. You have to be honest against guys like Nico Collins. And so Diggs should have more opportunities here. But yeah, let's look at the, the Diggs uh, target share before and after uh, Brady promoted to OC here. I mean, like you look at this, I mean, it, it, it drops down in every statistical category here. Look at the red zone. His target share in the red zone, you, you, your top weapon, a, a four-time pro bowler, one of the best receivers in the league, 11% target share in the red zone on third down, 19%. That's where I really think the Texans are going to put Stefan Diggs to good use is on third down. They want to give CJ a guy that I think they're going to use him in the slot a lot. I think they'll rotate him with Tank a little bit, but I think on third down, that's where they're going to be going, especially I think Houston looks back to that Ravens game when, okay, they're, they're kind of taking Nico away a little bit with their best corner. Who, who else can we go to? Well, you didn't have Tank Dell last year, and a bunch of your other receivers were hurt too. So now you're going to have Tank, you're going to have Nico and Dig. So if they're going to take away Nico as your outside receiver, you're going to have a lot of middle-of-the-field throws. They're going to be available for you right there. So I just – 
I think it was just a tale of two different coordinators last year. There was an, another comment here in this article that that Diggs had. A, a, he was on the injury report for his back week 10. He didn't miss any games, but perhaps he was playing with a little bit of a nagging back injury mm -hmm. towards the end of the season. Maybe that had something to do with it. We also know that they didn't get along that great, according to a lot of these reports between right. Diggs and, and, and Josh Allen. And there's a lot of people saying like, oh, why is that going to change in Houston? He's not going to get the same amount of targets that he got in Buffalo that he's going to get in Houston. So that's why he's going to be upset and it's not going to work out there. I don't necessarily believe that. I just think he's going to be so much more efficient with the targets that he does get than he's going to like his numbers at the end of the year. I think he's going to end up back in that you know, 1,300, 1,400 receiving yards. Maybe he's not catching 106 balls, something that he does pretty regularly with Buffalo, but I think he's going to catch a lot of passes, and I think they're going to have a lot of success as a team. And the big other thing we got to get to, right, is them adjusting his contract with him yeah. being in a contract year now. I mean, if you want that money, you want to go prove it. This is a way to do it right here. You got a chance to say, hey, that back half of last season was because of scheme. It wasn't because of my performance declining. And a lot of Texans fans, and let's talk about this a little bit. A lot of Texans fans have an issue that you could have. It looks like most likely you traded a second round pick to have Stefan Diggs for one season to take a shot at the Super Bowl. And some people feel like maybe that's a little too much to give for a player that's probably only going to be with you for one year. But I will say this, a lot of us like the idea of them trying to trade for Keenan Allen, which fell through a couple of weeks before the Diggs trade. And why did it fall through? Well, we think at the end of the day, the Chargers wanted to send him to the NFC so that they didn't have to see him in the AFC with the Texans. And what were the Texans reportedly offering for Keenan Allen? A player in his 30s, even a little older than Diggs, a third round pick. Yep. So you offered a future third for Keenan Allen that didn't go through. Now you offer a future second for Diggs that does go through. It's pretty comparable, but I will say this, if Minnesota has another down season and right now it's pre-draft, we don't really know if it's Sam Darnold at quarterback or if it's somebody they draft, it, there's a good chance they're bad. And that pick could end up being a really early second round pick. So that's kind of the concern, but I, I don't think the Texans care. They are in to win it right now. Yeah. I think I think so too. Look, I I I come at it. You you and I have talked about this, so you you know where I come at this. I come at it from I like this being a put the ball in his hand, you know, kind of thing. Like go prove yourself. Go. He's going to be extra motivated to go get that other contract. There won't be any question. The Texans won't have to answer questions as the season goes on about whether he's still going to be on the team. Like what you know whether they're going to keep him or not. Like granted, they can still address that in the offseason if they want to re-sign him. They'll they'll have first dibs at it, um, and as far as draft compensation, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a second next year, not this year in this year's right. draft. So I like that aspect of it. Is it high? Maybe, but man, if the guy were if you're getting a motivated Stephon Diggs on this team and he can, uh, you know, give you his production as as he can, you know uh, what he looks like. You know what his capability is. Draft picks are, are potential. And I mean, granted, that you usually get more out of a draft pick in the NFL than you do in the other leagues. Like uh, you can, you can, you're usually, especially in a second rounder, they are, you know, ready to ready to play. Uh, but that still that still doesn't guarantee you're going to get a guy, and especially it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a guy with the production of Stephon Diggs. Now, granted, will Diggs still be here, and will you miss that second rounder more next year? It remains to be seen, but I think if you get a, uh, a a premier performance out of Stefan Diggs, I don't think anyone's going to be opining, especially if they get deep into the playoffs. If they're able to get to a conference championship game, a place they've never been before in the history of this franchise, if they're able to compete for a spot in the Super Bowl, I don't think anyone's going to be opining that second round draft pick. No, I think you're right. And and that's what Casario is banking on too. And you have to wonder, you know, Stefan Diggs, I believe is going to turn 31, I think in November of this season. So he'll be playing part of the following season at 31, 32 years old. How many more years of that contract did they, did they really want to extend a guy into his thirties anyway? Right. Yeah. That's part of it too. And I guess if you really wanted to, I know the number would be huge. I guess you could franchise tag him if for some reason you wanted to keep him from getting away next year. 
to me, that doesn't make a ton of sense because if you're wiping all his all the years off his deal now to keep him happy and motivated, yeah, uh, you know, franchising him would probably really piss him off. So no, you know, and you might have to hold out. You know, who knows? So I, I don't know if that's going to be the plan with him. But the other elephant in the room is Nico Collins. If he has another big year, he's a free agent. Yeah. So I think that's what kind of is a little concerning. If we look down the road a little bit, you could have Nico and Stefan Diggs up for contracts at the end of this mm-hmm. season. I imagine you're only picking one of these guys to pay anyway, especially if Tank Dell stays healthy. And if Nico's this good again, I'm rolling with Nico because he's the younger player. He's the true outside receiver. A lot of people forget. Everybody's saying, oh, Diggs is your number one for sure. Nico had more receiving yards this past season and less games. Correct. But that is the bugaboo with Nico is can he stay healthy? Yeah. Well, look, and, and, and that certainly could be an issue, but that's what we call future problems with yeah. Nico's contract. I mean, you, you're only guaranteed uh, you know, what you have in front of you right now. And the Texans need to take advantage of this window. And so they're going to have to reevaluate things, especially with – you know, as contracts expire, you're going to have to reevaluate the team every season. And the good thing is, is that you are always going to have incoming draft picks coming to you. Not as many this season because you don't have anything in the first round and your second round pick is now gone for next year. But, you know, you're, you're going to have the draft to work with. So I'm, I'm bullish on uh, where the Texans are at right now. And, and I'm, I'm liking what Nick Casario did in this offseason, and he's really shoving right now. And I, I really like that because you don't know how many opportunities or how many bites at the apple that you're going to get uh, with, uh, you know, CJ Stroud because, you know, health is not guaranteed on any player. And so you, he's trying to take advantage of catch lightning in a bottle right now. I'm all on board with that. So uh, I think. I think uh, as this, you know, as we ramp up towards, uh, you know, the draft here, we're going to be even more excited. We're going to, it, it sucks on the one end, we don't really have any first round draft picks or, or you know, to kind of project out, but I think we're also going to have a whole lot of fun with the draft as we get close. We invite everyone to make sure they're following the channel so that, you know, as we're talking about that and featuring that content that you're with us and along for us for the ride. So that's going to be it. Appreciate the time uh, for everyone watching. Talk to you soon. Go Texans. 